Um, well, I wanted to say a good morning and a welcome to everybody that's here. If this is your first time, if you're a guest with us in the room, thank you guys so much for being here and investing the time this morning. We pray uh, that you would know God in some way, in some deeper level this morning. I want to say hey to everybody who's out there in Periscope land, or if uh, you're listening on the podcast or you're watching on the website also. Could we just put our hands together and welcome everybody um, this morning, guests, Periscope people. So um, it's that time of year again. Um, all of our hearts anticipate this, uh, this time of year, and you have the, the, the lights, the, the, the smells, the tastes, the sounds of Star Wars <laughs> coming out this week. I know everybody is just sitting on the edge of the seat ready to rock and roll. Uh, Thursday, this bad boy comes out. No, no, no. Really, it's the, it's the time of year. It's Christmas time, right? And uh, we love the, the, the fun, the joy, the merry of uh, the merriment of, of Christmas. That's how I feel too, buddy, you know. Um, uh, some of the sites you guys might recognize uh, are, are the Elf on the Shelf. Did, does anybody have an Elf visit their house also? We have, uh, Sparkle is at our house right now. Um, there are sometimes Sparkle doesn't move. Um, but I know there's a plan to it. I don't know why she hasn't flied uh, some evenings, so she just stays put. Uh, but I know there's a plan. Here's some uh, awesome elves that are out there doing some crazy things, some mischief. Um, uh, there's one out there uh, where an elf is uh, getting swole. You ever see he's got the marshmallows on the bar? He's just getting spelt, uh, as they say. Um, so anyway, it's Christmas time. This is all the fun stuff that's going on. You got opportunities to eat foods that you shouldn't need and hang out with people that you might not want to hang out with, but you get presents and fun times together. It's Christmas. It's the most wonderful time of the year. Uh, the psychologists say that not everyone finds Christmas time uh, to be a merry event for themselves. Um, in fact, stats show that 45% of people polled actually dread the holiday season. There's police uh, re reports that come out that say this time of year have the highest incidence of suicides and attempted suicides than any other time of year. Psychiatrists report significant increases in patients complaining of overwhelming and depressing thoughts. Some of these depressing thoughts, some believe uh, that, are, that, that come from the seasonal affective disorder when the time change and the sun is down before you get up or after you get up and then it's down when you get home from work. Anybody find that quite depressing, you know? Um, uh, some people actually, this brings on depressive thoughts this time of year. Some say that the commercialization of the holiday, uh, because of it, there's a natural increase in comparisons of those who have more and those who do more, and so it brings anxiety. Others feel the pressure to spend excessive amounts of money and increase sizable debt, and they know in January they're going to get the bills uh, that they spent in December. Some yet feel anxiety about the people that they are forced to spend time with. <laughs> yeah, we all we all been there before, you know. Um, while others had suffered loss at this time of year, and becomes um, difficult to to have joy during this time of year when that person is not present. I was just listening this week of um, actually three incidents uh, of children that passed uh, this past week. I know there's some connections to, um, it was an accident on, on 95 North where a 21-year-old uh, uh, Towson College student lost her life. Um, and another uh, story, we were in our communications team meeting and we were talking, it was a 22-year-old uh, that, that lost their life also. It's, sometimes it's difficult to be merry at Christmas when... Uh, there's a very important person that's not present in the room, right? If any of us have experienced loss, sometimes it becomes difficult to have a Merry Christmas when that person is gone. And here's the point. Christmas isn't merry for everyone. Though some of us find this time of year to be fun, uh, but uh, beneath the Christmas trees and lights and carols and cookies lie in some of our hearts a deep, deep wound that are seemingly wrapped anew every year only to be torn open like an unwanted gift that won't go away. It makes Christmas difficult to enjoy. The fact is, for some of us in this room, this is the worst time of year, and we dread it 
uh, as it comes around every year. So for some of us, the bells we hear aren't ones of joy, but rather, rather uh, a funeral dirge, if you will. The reality is that Christmas can often be a season of overwhelming stress, hurt, and the pain of loss. And so could the solution be more parties, be more gifts, be more spending, be more food, be more time with people? Can that be really the solution? I was reading this week about uh, an incident that happened back in about the 8th century uh, in the Mideast. Um, uh, some depressing decisions happened for a guy there in the 8th century BC. There's a king named Ahaz, and uh, he heard of a plot to come in and, and conquer his his realm. And so there was this Confederate army, people joining forces to the north of Israel. And so he hired the king of Assyria to to help him out. And so the king of Assyria, which was the largest mass up there in the biggest kingdom in the area at the time, he takes King Ahaz's money. It was actually gold from the temple um, in Jerusalem. He pays him with. And the king of Assyria takes this money goes and conquers the two Confederate kings that were coming against Israel, but he didn't stop there. He kept going down and conquered Israel. The guy who paid him to help him, he came in and and conquered his place also. And so King Ahaz is in a a pretty depressing place. I'm sure his Christmas wasn't that merry also. And the prophet Isaiah, which we have in our Old Testament, he writes this because he was prophet during the era of these, these kings Um, And Isaiah tells him, he says, uh, while this is happening, he says, look, I want you to chill out. Don't worry, Ahaz. Uh, God's going to take care of it. He's going to take care of these two kings. Don't intervene. Don't get involved. Just just butt out of it. Keep your nose out of this. And Ahaz did, in fact, worry and stick his nose where it didn't belong. And it came back uh, to bite him in, in the end, he didn't listen to what Isaiah was telling him. Like, look, I, I, God's going to take care of this. I'm telling you, you just need to calm yourself down. Don't get all stressed out. Don't, don't you know, ramp yourself up and do something that you're going to, to regret. And so Ahaz actually relies on money to get himself out of a problem uh, that it's not going to help with. And so he pays off someone and it backfires, uh, which a quick sidebar, money doesn't solve everything. I know some of you guys are looking at your shopping list and you're saying, if I had just a couple extra bucks, uh, it could solve a couple things like this thing and this thing and this thing. Uh, But as Ahaz learned, don't rely on dollars to get you out of something that only God can do. And so he says, look, guys, uh, don't worry, Ahaz, God's going to take care of this. Actually, in the seventh chapter, uh, which we don't have time to get into this morning, there's a prophecy about Jesus that he writes, 714. He says, look, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, God with us. We later come to find out that that was referencing Jesus. 800 years later, before Jesus, uh, Jesus ever came, 800 years before that, Isaiah's talking about this virgin giving birth. And he says, look, don't worry, guys. God's going to send a Savior, and he's going to get us out of this mess. And so Ahaz doesn't listen, pays off the Assyrians, and uh, they come not just and kill those two kings, but go all the way down into Israel and ransack the place. They take everything, steal everything, uh, rape, pillage, plunder this entire nation. And so Ahaz is left um, with nothing. So you talk about depressing time. He's lost everything. He's probably made the worst decision of his life. He's responsible to lead an entire nation, and now he's opened the door to destruction and depression. It remains nothing but pain and misery is happening right around here. But Isaiah is still writing during this time. He starts the ninth chapter with sort of a change of pace. He says, look, guys, I know it's bad right now. I know that you're not happy. Nobody's singing songs in the streets, but I want to tell you that things are going to turn around And this is where we hear this verse about a child being born, that where we reference um, Jesus all the time. And I want to show it to you. I want to take you there. Isaiah starts the ninth chapter, and he says it this way. He says, look, nevertheless, which is a pretty heavy word, because there's nothing good happening right now. Everybody is bummed. Everybody is depressed. Nobody has anything. I mean, you can imagine everything that they own is up in flames, or it just walked off with someone who had a sword, like death or take my things. That was a choice that people had. And so they're standing around, and Isaiah says, you know what? Nevertheless, just a little preacher sidebar moment. I'm sorry. I don't know what you're facing, but this is a heavy word. 
I know you may have came in with a heavy load on your back, stress, anxiety, maybe loss. Maybe you are that person that's feeling that depression. Let me just tell you, nevertheless, I know you're facing heavy things, but nevertheless, God has a plan. He's going to bring relief. Let's keep reading. He said, nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. Jump down to the second verse. He says, the people that were walking in darkness, they have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. He's saying, things are about to change, guys. I know you're feeling it right now, but let me tell you what's about to happen. We jump down to the sixth verse. He says, for to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Nevertheless, for those that are in gloom and distress, don't worry about it. Things are about to change because a son is given to us. A child has been born, and the government will be on his shoulders. Things are about to change. Seven, eight hundred years, about 750 years before Jesus was born, Isaiah writes this prophecy as a relief to what's happening then. Historians call it the Assyrian crisis, where this guy takes his money and then goes as a bully and just takes everything else of his, you know. It's like, thanks for funding my campaign to come and conquer you. The Assyrian crisis. Isaiah's standing in the middle of desolate cities, and he says, hey, guys, don't worry. I've got a solution. Imagine everybody thinking, okay, this guy's going to get us some kind of military campaign. Maybe he's got a strategy. Maybe he's got a horde of weapons in his tent over there where he's going to help and, and, and get us out of this mess. Maybe he's got a whole lot of cash where he can come pay off our debt and we can, you know, ramp up our armies and we can go back and take what they just stole. He says, no, 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 I got a solution. There's a, a baby going to be born. Womp, womp, Right? Hey, I feel a lot safer now that he's around, you know. He's got it. Nope. He says, don't fret, don't feel overwhelmed, don't worry, don't stress, because a, a child, a child's going to come, he's going to be born, and he's going to take care of it. The scripture answers the worst problem you could imagine. Everything was gone. He says, it's going to be cool. Don't worry about it. A child's going to, be born, or going to be born. Isaiah goes on to tell us that we don't understand that this is just, uh, it's not just any child. We don't really understand the future of this kid. This kid that's going to be born, the government's going to be on his shoulders. He's going to be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Over the last few years, as if you've been around any length of time, you know our family has gone through a few ups and downs, and it's been kind of chaotic uh, the past two years. And so over the past two years, I, I've, I've seen a, a good amount of counselors. I've been in a few counseling sessions. Can I get an amen? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Um, and so uh, hooray for counselors. You know, these guys are great. I'm going to pay you a couple dollars, just sit there, and I'm going to tell you everything that's going wrong in my life. And just, just smile and nod. You know, that's all I need you to do. Um, a good counselor can listen. And I've had a, a, a few good counselors. I've been to th- Three, just trying, trying different guys out. A good counselor knows when to listen. A bad counselor doesn't know when to shut their mouth, right? You're trying to talk, and they're just going like this, like, no, 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 I'm not paying to hear you. I'm, I'm paying for you to hear me, and then you kind of sort my thoughts out and give them back to me, you know? A good counselor knows when to listen. They have a good ear. They, they know when to speak when it's appropriate and, and ask pointed questions so they can dig deeper beneath the surface of really what the stress is going on in your life. They know how to get beneath that. Because the problem is never really the problem. The problem is how you're handling the problem, you know? And a good counselor knows how to get beneath the surface and, and knows when to listen. And they listen twice as much as they speak. And they know how to hear what's really happening beneath the surface. Isaiah says, look, this little baby to us was born 2,000 years ago. He says that he's going to be just that. He's going to be a wonderful counselor. The child that's going to be born is going to to, to be able to hear us out, to be able uh, to listen to what's going on in our life and be attentive to our needs. A child was born to give us hope in the face of hurt. That's our promise this morning. 2,000 years ago, a child was born to give you and I hope in the face 
of hurt, that he hears our distress, that he's attentive to the needs that are going on in our life. If you don't remember anything else, I want you to remember this. A child has been born to give you hope in the face of whatever you're hurting. He's got a couch open, and he's saying, hey, what's on your mind? What brings you in today? What's troubling you? What's, uh, what's overwhelming you? You seem a little stressed, bummed, hurt. You seem to be carrying a lot on your shoulders. Can I help you with that? Actually, can I carry that for you? Can I help you with that? Jesus himself says it in, in, in uh, Matthew 11. He says, look, I want you to take my yoke. Let me teach you because I'm humble, I'm gentle at heart, and, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. He says, look, let's do a little trade. You look like you're like, about to just crush under the weight of everything you're holding on to. Why don't you give that to me, and I'll trade you. I'll, I'll give you my yoke or my burden, and, and you're going to see the, the thing that I'm going to give you is, is actually pretty light. It's really not a fair trade at all. Let me take that off of your shoulder. So I'll ask you this question to us in the room today. What's overwhelming you? What's overwhelming you? Isaiah goes on to say there's another name for this baby. He says he's going to be called a wonderful counselor and a mighty God. See, in our eyes, he came as a helpless baby. And that's what this, this series is, is, is always interesting to me, is to remember that Christ came as this helpless child. Like the video we saw right before, uh, right before the announcements, kids rolling down hills and babies taking their first steps and that baby laughing in the tub. If, if, you, if your heart doesn't like beat quicker when you watch that, you're dead. That's all I can say. Try editing that video and watching it about 24 times. I'm crying like the third one. <laughs> Every time you laugh, I'd rewind. <laughs> We often forget that Jesus comes as this, this, helpless, this helpless child. We always picture him as, as the memes say, you know, he's teaching on a hill and some text is over top of him, you know. We have this picture and maybe if you come from a Catholic background, you know, you, 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 it's seared into your mind that Jesus on the cross, you know, he's up there and that's the picture we have. But we often forget that he comes as a helpless child. If you've ever been around newborns or children under the age of one or two, they really can't do much for themselves, right? We cheer when they, they can hold the bottle for themselves. You're like, yes, woo, you know, and all they're doing is just hanging on. They're not really doing anything. You know, they, really can't, they really can't do much for themselves. We often forget that Jesus comes this way, but he didn't stay that way. He grows to be a man. He's finally, he becomes this, he steps into his role as the Messiah. He's recognized as the Christ, the anointed one, the chosen one. And we come to learn that he's actually God in the flesh. And so that's even more difficult for us to, to wrap our minds around that he's this mighty God looking like just a normal person, a, a normal human being. Now, all of scripture writes about the might of this God that we know in the person of Jesus. David said in the Psalms, he said, great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limits. Job said it this way, these are just the beginning of all he does, merely a whisper of his power. Who then can comprehend the thunder of his great power? The psalmist writes again, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. Paul writes to the Ephesians, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Jeremiah penned the words on God's behalf. God saying, he said, look, behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too difficult for me? Whoa. He just kind of dropped the mic. Like, I can do anything. Have you not figured that out yet? Is anything too difficult for me? Isaiah said this way later on. He says, have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint, does not grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and to him who has no might. He increases in strength. Even youth shall faint and grow weary and young men shall fall exhausted. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. 
God, the one that we serve, who started as this helpless baby, is a mighty God. He's a strong God. He's capable of handling the burden which you're trying to shoulder yourself. He may have been born as a child, helpless and vulnerable, but but beneath the surface is the immutable, ancient, timeless, and mighty God that breathed the foundations of the earth and spoke the cosmos into existence. Isaiah later writes in 59.1, he says, surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save because he's, he's mighty. He says, nor is his ear too dull to hear because he's a wonderful counselor. Not only can he hear what you are saying to him, he's strong enough to help you with it. Peter writes this, one of Jesus' followers in one of Peter's letters, he says, so humble yourselves under the mighty power of God and at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God for he cares for you. So I'll pose the question again, what is overwhelming you? Because it's different for each of us. What's the problem of the person next to you is not going to be the same problem for the person behind you. The burden you're carrying is going to be different than anyone else's in this room. But I'll ask, what's overwhelming you? Because I, I, would, I would dare to bet that God is a good enough counselor to hear out your problem. And he's mighty enough to actually carry it for you if you would give him the opportunity. A child was born to give us hope in the face of hurt. It's easy for us to feel overwhelmed, especially this time of year. Expectations are high, pressures, crushing circumstances and appointments to get from one place to the next. Like Isaiah's time, circumstances were terrible. They were crushing. There was nothing positive happening around them. And you can imagine the pressure of, come on, guys, we got to get out of this. we gotta, we got to dig ourselves out of this. Come on, put a smile on your face. We'll rebuild We'll do it again. We got to keep moving. Keep marching on. I know this didn't work out, but we got to keep moving forward. In the midst of all of this, our hurt, our anxieties, we can't forget that a child was born, a son was given. And you know, the beautiful gift about Christmas is that the gift that was given was Christ Himself. He gave Himself. And we know that it eventually ends at the cross before the tomb. But he gave the gift of himself. He said, look, I want to carry your burden for you. What's overwhelming you? I, I'm a wonderful counselor. I promise. Let's just talk it out. Let's take a seat. Come on, tell me what's on your mind. You look kind of stressed. Are you okay? I have this thing when people ask me, hey, hey, PC, how are you doing? I can't, I can't bring myself to give an empty, like, things are great. I can't do that. There's something in me that I cannot do. And so when people say, hey, man, how's it going? I have to pause and think, like, how is it going? <laughs> say, pretty good. I guess yeah, 82%. I'm hanging in there, you know? <laughs> and people react and they say, like, you had to think about it for a second. Are you sure that it's going that well? You look like you, you may have been questioning yourself. I'm like, well, I just wanted to give you an honest answer, you know? I can imagine Jesus walking around saying, hey, is everything cool? And people are like, oh, yeah, 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 fine, everything's great. You know, I'm fine. I'm just dying here. You know, my whole family is just broken to pieces. I have nothing left, but everything is good. Jesus is like, no, 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 can, can you slow down for a second and just, and just think about it? Uh, are you doing okay? You look like things are, are kind of blowing up in your face. Like, are, are you, I'm, a, I'm a wonderful counselor. I mean, you got five minutes? Can, I just want to hear you out. Is everything all right? How often do we walk by, and like, oh, everything's good, Jesus, everything's good, you know, I'm cool, everything's great, I would just really like you to fix all this stuff over here, you know, I'm fine, just fix this, you know. He said, no, 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 why don't you just talk it out, man, I'm a wonderful counselor. The gift he gave was himself. Not only does he want to hear out what's going on in your life, he wants a chance to carry it for you. Hey, can you just put that down, let's trade, let's trade, I, 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 I I, I just want to hand this over to you. I know this is kind of weird. I want to carry your burden forward. And you can carry this because I guarantee you what I'm carrying is way lighter than what you're carrying. The gift Christ gave was him, himself. 
What if there was an open invitation to quit worrying about whatever major issue is happening in your life? What if there was an open invitation to lay down the responsibility of something you were unable to change anyway? What if there was an open invitation to trust in someone greater than yourselves about an issue that's just as great? This morning, you may not know if you believe all this Jesus stuff, and I understand that. You may not understand if God is just some cosmic Santa Claus where we just ask him things and, and hope he, he brings it to us like some kind of gift, if this is all fairy tale stuff. That, that, that's not the question yet. I, I just want to extend an open invitation to you. And I'll start with a question. What's overwhelming you? Because that's what Jesus wants to hear about. That's what he wants to help you carry. You may be sitting here thinking, well, Pastor Chris, I don't really have any big problems. I, I, I hear this a lot. I ask people, hey, is there any prayer requests that you have or things you want to pray about? And I, there's a lot of times I get an answer like, no, I'm good. Everything's, everything's fine. You may be sitting here saying, you know, Pastor Chris, I don't really have anything overwhelming me right now. Like, things are good. I, I, I'm okay with that. And that's cool. I, I, I get that. Maybe extend a question to people around you that are, that are overwhelmed. Do you know anybody that's, that's overwhelmed, that seems to be at the brink, that anxiety has just overtaken them and they, don't, they can't see the light at the end of the tunnel? Do you know anyone that is overwhelmed? Today when you came in, you were handed a card. Everybody get one of these cards blank on, on the one side? Here's how we're going to end our time this morning. I want you to grab a pen, find one, borrow one if you can. The host team is going to grab this cross over here, and they're going to bring it uh, right dead center. I'm going to give you the opportunity. And I know what th this card is, is just a piece of paper. I, I get that. But what you write on it has the power to free you the thing that's written on this card has the power to ruin you. And so I want you to write this morning that thing that's overwhelming you. And like I said, you might not be the person that's overwhelmed, but maybe you know someone who is. And so here, here's how we're going to end this morning. I'm going to ask you to take that card, grab a pen. I want you to write the answer to that question. What's overwhelming you? 